And so last week, he forgave his brothers. What you're going to see today is in chapter 50. If you're a Bible person, go ahead and pull out your Bibles. We're going to Genesis chapter 50. It's the very last chapter in the book of Genesis. This happens 16 years. Say 16. 16 years after Joseph forgave his brothers and we kind of thought the story was over. Now we're going to leapfrog 16 years into the future into Genesis chapter 50 and here's what happened. See, he forgave his brothers. Why? Do you remember? Because they threw him in the pit and they sold their own brother into slavery in Egypt. I mean, that's kind of a big deal, right? Lot to forgive. It's a big thing. So he forgives them last week. 16 years have gone by. What's about to happen is their dad, Jacob, old man, Jacob, father of the 12 brothers. Do you remember the family, the dysfunctional family of Jacob and some of his dysfunctional attributes as a dad? He finally passes away in this chapter. And when he does, the brothers all get together, including Joseph, and they like caravan to Canaan. And if you're a Bible student, you know why that's important. Like they go to the cave where Abraham was buried and they buried Jacob there. And it's this whole thing. And then the caravan two weeks back. And it's been this whole big family event that they've had. And you think, well, now this is closed up. And here's what happens, verse 15. But now that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers became fearful. Now, Joseph will show his anger and pay us back for all the wrong that we did to him, they said. So they sent this message to Joseph. Before your father Jacob died, he instructed us to say this to you. Please forgive your brothers for a great wrong that they did to you for their sin in treating you so cruelly. So the brothers send this message and they say, Joseph, you don't know this, but our dad wrote kind of a last will and testament, wrote kind of a goodbye note, final words on his deathbed. And he wrote this down and we're sending it to you and says, Joseph, please forgive us for real and don't kill us. Did Jacob write the note? No, no, he didn't write that thing. I mean, it's possible, but no, they're afraid. Watch what happens. They totally made that up. So we, the servants of the God of your father, beg you to forgive our sin. When Joseph received this message, he broke down and he wept. Then his brothers came and threw themselves down physically before Joseph. So now they're entering his presence. First, they sent the note, right? So like he could dwell on it, calm down. Look, we are your slaves, they said. So they make this really good speech to him. They make this really good speech where they, they name drop, if you notice, they name drop the dad and say, because you love the dad, you should love us and not kill us. And then they say, we're the servants of the God of your father. So now they're name dropping God. And then they're saying, we, we're, we're begging you to forgive us. And they're, they're like, we totally admit we were so cruel to you. And oh, by the way, we'll be your slaves. And Joseph breaks down and weeps. Did you notice that? That's so weird. Why does he do that? Why does he, why does he weep? Because it's been 16 years and he already forgave them once. And he thought they were reconciled. He thought they were okay. He thought they believed him. He thought, you know, when they were getting together and they were having the cookouts and the barbecue and the little kids are running around and they're having all this time together, right? 16 Christmases, 16 Easter's, not really, but you know what I mean. But all of that stuff had already happened and what he's seeing right now is the veil is pulled back and they've secretly been dreading this moment, thinking that man, as soon as dad is dead, he's really gonna bring it. Because dad won't think bad of him. And maybe he was holding back because he thought dad was going to. Or maybe he was holding back for other reasons. Maybe, maybe the evil that we did to him by selling him into slavery is just so evil it could never be forgiven. And they got all these things that they're wondering, right? And so he breaks down and weeps because he knows what his forgiveness actually was. It was total. It was complete. I wanted you to be free all this time. And and instead, you've been suffering for 16 years. So here's what he says to him. But Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I could punish you? No. You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. And so he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. So here's what he does. Three things that he says to them 
that are part of his forgiveness. Here's the speech that he makes, Joseph's forgiveness, verse 19. Am I God that I could punish you? He says, I'll never do vengeance. I'll never punish you. Not even the tiny little Christian punishments we sometimes do to each other. We talked about that last week. That's verse 19. Verse 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for the good of Egypt and for the whole ancient world, the good of many people, the salvation of many people, he says. I see a bigger picture. Even though you did a bad thing to me, God had another plan, and that comforts me. That brings me comfort. And then third, verse 21, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you. And that's him saying, I want you to be at peace. I wanted you to be at peace all this last 16 years. Please be at peace now. Please feel actually forgiven now. And oh, by the way, I'm going to take care of you as well. In short, Joseph forgave them before. He forgives them again. But they're the ones who couldn't forgive themselves. Do you ever hear people say that? Yeah, they forgave and God forgave, but I couldn't forgive myself. Richard Baxter, who was a Puritan minister in 1659 in England, he wrote this. He said, that sorrow, even for sin, may be overmuch. That overmuch sorrow swalloweth one up. You can tell he's British and old because he said, <laughs> he said, swalloweth. Love that. But I love the idea of overmuch sorrow. Say over much. Over much. Too much. Like, it's possible for a Christian to feel guilty and to feel bad about what they've done. And this pastor here in the 1600s is like, I see this thing happening in the church where people get sad, but they get too sad. They get too guilty. They get too bogged down. And they get into this place where God doesn't even want them to be. It's not helpful for them to be. So we're going to explore that today because that's where Joseph's brothers were. Amen. They couldn't forgive themselves. What a weird little phrase. And we use it all the time. And we don't think that the Bible talks about it, but the Bible talks about it. So we're going to talk about it today. You've got a little sheet of paper on your seat. Can you get that? Grab that guy. It's got a little box. You folks online, grab a post-it note or something. You can do this with us. But you got a little piece of paper with this little box here. And I want you to look at that box for a second. And I want you to realize that we've all got those 11 brothers in us just a bit. And here's what we do. We've got this sin. I'm going to give you two categories. We got this sin that we did in the past that was just so massive, like them selling him into slavery. And, and you did a thing. And it's in your past. And you know, whenever you think about your top sins, it's like, that's the one. If something gets me to hell, man, that's the thing. It was bad. It was so bad. And I want you to see it in this box or write it in this box. And we are not reading these later, by the way. Nobody's reading these. They're all being destroyed. Maybe write them. Write it in there. If you're going to write it, fold it so nobody can see it. But I want you to hold on to this. Maybe it wasn't the big thing. Maybe what's got you, is you're like, I don't have anything like that. What's got you is the sin that you can't stop doing. Because that's the other thing. That like when you're before God, you're like, oh, someday the lightning bolt is going to come down from heaven and strike my head. I just know it is because I've, I've failed too many times. This addictive sin pattern that I've got in my life. I know Jesus said 70 times seven, and that's 490 for you math people. And you're like, but I've crossed 490 a long time ago. And I don't know that I can be forgiven because it was in my life yesterday. It was in my life this morning and I can't get free and it makes me question my salvation. It makes me question whether or not God could even love a person like me. Could you see it in that box for just a second? Because I think you need that and I think you need to see it there or write it there. I think you need it and I want you to hold on to that for the entire rest of the message. Are you with me? Have you got your paper? Is it in your hand? You need it. You need it. And we won't read it later, I promise. 
So my son introduced me one time to this YouTube channel and the YouTube channel is called How It Should Have Ended. Anybody ever see a video clip from How It Should Have Ended? All right, two of us, three in the room. All right, um, here's what they do. How It Should Have Ended, they're like animators, right? And they go to these old movies and they go to stories and they say, we didn't like the ending. We're gonna rewrite the ending to that and we're gonna animate it and it's gonna be comedy and it's gonna be a good time. And so here's what, how it should have ended. Here's what they did to Lord of the Rings. And some of you might know me and you might know that I like Lord of the Rings. Yeah. So Lord of the Rings is this epic saga. It's three volumes long. Peter Jackson made the longest movies in movie history, I think, just to tell this story. It was so wonderful and fabulous. And, and it starts in the very beginning where there's this ring because it's Lord of the Rings. There's this ring and it's super, super evil. And the only way that that ring can be destroyed is it's got to be thrown down in this big lava pit in a place called Mount Doom. And it takes them three books to get there. You're like, well, that sounds like an easy thing. It's not. It's a big journey. And a lot of people die along the way. And there's a whole lot of different events. And it's a beautiful journey to watch it unfold. And here's what these terrible people from how it should have ended did to my story. They come along. So the way the story actually goes is Frodo and Sam. You know Frodo and Sam. And they, 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 like, they get the ring and they toss it into the lava at the very end. But it's been such a journey and they're like almost dead, you know, and they're at the side of this volcano and they're about to die. And then Gandalf sends these massive eagles to fly in and grab them and they save them and they get them to safety and it's all wonderful and a great ending. So the how it should have ended people come along and they're like, wait a second, if you had e eagles all along, Gandalf, Why didn't you just give them the ring in chapter one? Just have them fly it into the mountain. Isn't that horrible? How dare they to my story? Anyway, so then I take that idea and I'm like, what if we could have done a how it should have ended in the Bible? Right? Like, this is fun. Like, what if... Jesus died and he rose from the dead and he's about to get ascended into heaven. He's standing there with his disciples and he's got some things to say and he says all of them. But what if he would have just added to the speech? You know, someday somebody's going to come along. I'm just warning you. And they're going to have this idea for something called daylight savings time. Just don't do it. Oh, what would they have, what, what would that have saved us? Or what if, what if Jesus, right before he sent it into heaven, he's like, um, I'm going to issue an omnipotent command right here into creation. Mosquitoes, done. Oh, would you just love him more? Yes. It didn't happen though. So anyway, what if we could change the endings? What if you could change the endings of some of the Bible characters in the other way, not to make it better, but what if you, what if you could imagine a different ending to some of the characters in the Bible that were forgiven and accepted that forgiveness? What if the prodigal son refused to be forgiven? Right, like the prodigal comes up to the dad and you know the story and he's blown all the money and he's done all this sin and he comes up the road and says, I'm not a worthy guy. Just make me a servant, make me a slave, right? He does that and the father's like, absolutely not. You're my son, I love you. Here's a rope, here's a ring on your finger, not an evil ring, but a good ring on your finger. And he's like, and we're gonna throw a massive party for you and like, we're gonna kill the fatted calf and it's just gonna be this amazing party, invite all the friends. And that's what the story says. What if the prodigal said, yeah, but I can't be forgiven. I can't forgive myself. What if the party happened and the robe's still on the hook and the ring is still on the table and the prodigal's sitting in a corner sulking because he can't ever really feel free? What would have happened then? Right, like that'd be a twist and that'd be a tough twist. But what it illustrates is the fact that the prodigal had the power to derail grace in his life. And there would not have been joy. There would not have been reconciliation. It would not be the story. What if Peter, after having denied Jesus Christ three times, and we know this, they've been telling us this since we were kids, right? 
And after Peter does the major betrayal of Jesus, and we talked about this at Easter, and then, then, then Jesus shows up at the seashore and makes him breakfast and restores Peter and forgives him and makes him a pastor again. What if Peter would have said, Jesus, that's great that you want to make me a pastor again, but I can't ever forgive myself for what I've done. What if that happened? Because it could have. Because if that happened, we wouldn't have Peter. See, Peter's this crazy story, right? Like he becomes the leader of the early church. And what is he except he is the poster child for forgiven screw-ups. Like that's Peter, the poster child for forgiven screw-ups. Is he not? Isn't that why we love him so much and talk about him so much? It's not because he inspires us with all his awesomeness. Peter is the patron saint of forgiven screw-ups, and we love him for it. We want to read about Peter, and we want to hear more about Peter because we see ourselves in Peter. And can you imagine him as the leader of the early church? Do you know how much grace filled the early church? Because Peter not only was forgiven by an incredible God, but Peter received it, and he didn't change the ending. Have you changed the ending in your life? Did God come along and offer you an amazing forgiveness? And did you hijack the process and not even know that you did? Because you didn't know that you did. So, yeah, but I can't forgive myself. There's a, the story of Joseph. Do you have that slide with those ages on it? I actually skipped it, but I want you guys to see it. There it is. If this is your first week with us on this series... This is how we've been going through the story of Joseph. Age 17, he was thrown in that pit and he was sold into slavery. Then he went to Potiphar's house as a slave, if you remember. He was in prison for quite a while, suffering there. Finally, at age 30, he shows up in the palace and he interprets Pharaoh's dreams. He becomes the prime minister of all Egypt. Everything becomes awesome. You think it's all over, but no, at, verse, at, at age 39, his brothers show up, and he learns that the real purpose in all this, the deepest purpose in all this, is what God is doing to his family and the reconciliation that he wants to bring there because this isn't just any family. These are the patriarchs and these are the fathers of the faith and God is going after them. And so he finds purpose there. And at 56, he has to re-pardon his brothers again 16 years later. And they suffered for 16 years before that happened. Are, are you suffering? Okay, so that's some bad news. Are you ready for some good news? Let's get some good news. First one, it's 1 John 1, 9, because this is how it's supposed to work. Sometimes it doesn't work, and here's how it's supposed to work. 1 John 1, 9 says, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Hallelujah. Amen? This is how it's supposed to work. If you are a Christian today... And the way I define that term is at one point you decided to no longer steer your life, but you handed the steering over to Jesus. And you said, I'm going to give you my life. I need your life to come in and forgive all my sins and make me new. If you had that moment of surrender, you're a Christian today because God did something amazing inside your soul when that happened. And then you get to do this every single time. You feel distance between you and God. You get to come and confess it. And then it's forgiven and cleansed and you move on. Done. You're like, wait a second. Where's the waiting and the guilting and the penance? It's not there. You're not supposed to do that part. The church weirdly added that later. But that's not true. Uh, Bill Bright calls this spiritual breathing. He imagines you could do this in the car right? Because you remember all the bad things you did that morning to your wife while you're in the car. Can I get an amen? So you're there and you confess that quickly to God. And what you do is you breathe out your confession of what you did and you breathe in his forgiveness. It takes about 30 seconds and done. You get to walk in total freedom and peace. Amen. Come on, second service. Amen. 
This is exciting stuff. So that's the way it's supposed to work. That's number one. Number two, Psalm 103 verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So they're not even here anymore is what he's saying. And he removed them from you as far as the east is from the west. How far is that, you math people? That's infinity. He's trying to describe infinity. He has moved your sins away to infinity and beyond, Buzz Lightyear. That's what Psalm 103 says. Amen? Amen. Hebrews 8, 12. He forgets them all. And I will forgive their wickedness and I will never again remember their sins. So God forgives it and he cleanses you and he removes it from you and he removes it from his memories as well. And I know some people read that verse and they're like, well, I don't think God actually doesn't remember. He just doesn't bring it up to you and bug you with it anymore. I disagree. I think an omnipotent, holy, creative God knows how to dive right into his own memory banks and say, erasing that one right now. And I don't even remember. But do you see, this is the important part. Do you see how much he's going out of his way to tell you you're actually forgiven? Not just a little forgiven, you're actually forgiven. Do you see how he's reaching toward you? Some of you guys need some of these phrases and these are what you need to remember every single day. And you need to speak them to yourselves in those moments of guilt when those things are hounding you. So let's talk about those moments. Let's talk about that hounding. Let's talk about those feelings for a second. This is 2 Corinthians 7.10. It says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Interesting. So he describes two Christians going down two different roads. And one Christian is experiencing godly sorrow and the other one is experiencing what he calls worldly sorrow. And the one who's experiencing godly sorrow, look, look how the progression goes. It makes them want to change repentance. And that leads to salvation and to, to greater and greater freedom and joy and health in their life. It leads to salvation and it leaves no regret behind. No feelings of lingering guilt. That's the way godly sorrow actually works. You're like, wait a second, but they were trying to make me feel guilty. Yeah, but here's how the Holy Spirit does it. The Holy Spirit comes and gives you just enough conviction in order to thrust you into repentance and get your attention and say, confess it and be done. But he doesn't want to linger with your guilt for years and years and years. You're like, then why do I feel it then? Because there's other voices. You're like, pastor, you're telling me I hear voices? Heck yes, you do. We all do, right? So the first voice that we hear often is the voice of the accuser. The voice of the enemy, Satan himself. So the word devil in the, in the um, uh, Greek, diabolos. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right, but I'm just going to go with it. Diabolos, right? What diabolos means in the Greek is the slanderer or the accuser. That's what devil means. And so in the book of Revelation, he's finally cast into the lake of fire. And, and, and the, I think it's the angels or the Christians erupt and say, finally, the accuser of the brethren is cast down. The one who accused us day and night. He never stopped accusing us. Not, not only did he stand in God's throne room and say, these people are no good. But he accuses you in your mind every day. It's in his best interest to have the prodigal sitting in the corner sulking. It's in his best interest to shut down grace. And we think we're being noble. No, we're not. So that's the other voice. And you got to recognize that voice because that voice will not leave no regret. He wants to keep you in regret nonstop. The third voice is your own pride. Because there's a part of you, and this is this, is this false nobility thing. There's a part of you that says, yeah, forgiveness is for other people, but I haven't paid enough. And if you only knew what I had done, you would know. I've got to keep paying. And it sounds good. It sounds right, but it's not. And it's not scriptural. And you have to discern those voices on a daily basis. I was, uh, I was at a church service one time, and 
We did prayer team after where we do prayer team after our services every week here. And there's a group of people that will pray for you. And I was on the prayer team that week and I was back with people. And all of a sudden this woman walked up to us after the service and, and she said, would you pray for me? And I'm like, why are we praying for you? And, and she said, because she said, because I came today. And I'm like, okay, great. You came. And she's like, you don't understand. I've pulled up into this church parking lot for the last four weeks straight. And the other three, I couldn't walk in. I'd pull up into the spot and I would just sit there. And she's like, because I knew what I had done. And I knew how long it had been since I had been in church. And I knew how much I had rejected God and disappointed him. And she went on this tirade against herself, gave me the speech. And she's like, today is the first day that I was able to overcome it and finally come inside. Oh, isn't this where we live actually? Aren't these the things that we do to ourselves actually? What was amazing is she overcame it that day. By the power of God, she overcame it that day. See, and that's the win. That's the victory that she came inside. Amen? Amen. Amen. You need to say that louder because everybody in here needs to hear you. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's what we're about. We're not about keeping people in corners. We're not a country club. Come and pay your dues. Be really, really clean so that we don't have to be around the dirty people. Can I be real for a second? This is a hospital for sinners. Let's be real about who we are because it's grace that changes us, not our personal holiness. It's not. The power's in Jesus. It's in his gospel. It's not in us. So I, I need to tell you some things, and these are hard, hard things. So you're like one of these people wandering around my church saying, Pastor never gives it to us tough. Here comes the tough. Here comes the deep. And before I say these words, and I think this, this is a surgical moment in our hearts because we do have a false nobility inside of us, and it has to be countered with truth. But as I speak these words, I just want you to know, this is, this is not me being harsh. This is not me beating on you. This is, this is me trying to understand where we're all at because I'm right there with you. We believe many times when we say we can't forgive ourselves, we believe we are wiser than God. We're saying that our judgment about sin is better and wiser than God's judgment. We think that we know better. He might be quicker to forgive, but we have higher standards. It's back there. Yeah, like I've never thought those words before. I know me either, but it's back there. We believe that God cannot keep his promise and we're calling into question his faithfulness. Even though he said in his word that he remembers our sins no more, we don't believe him. We believe that's poetry or meant for somebody else, but we don't trust his word. This is supreme arrogance. It's not nobility, it's arrogance. We believe that in our pride that we need to pay our own way. Somebody taught us as kids when we were growing up that the strong pay for their things themselves and the strong pull themselves up by their own bootstraps and get themselves there. And those that accept grace and charity, that equates to weakness. And there's a part of us that has transferred that growing up idea onto the gospel and onto your relationship with God. And it doesn't fit. It doesn't. It's a hidden arrogance that's inside of us. There's a deep humility in a Christian that comes to the cross of Jesus Christ and says, I can't pay. You pay. And God does. That's hard stuff. And then finally, we have a hidden belief that Jesus did not pay enough to cover us. He did not suffer enough on his cross. He did not bleed enough. When God poured out the punishment of the sins of all the world on his own son, and he suffered through that, not only the physical and mental pain, but the separation between him and God the Father 
we believe secretly with, and never say it out loud. We believe he didn't pay enough. Because if he'd have only known our evil, if he'd have only known just how many times I was going to do this repetitive sin, he would have had to have paid more. It's not true. Again, let me affirm, I'm right there with you. Let me affirm, I'm not trying to beat up anybody. These are the things that are in the back of our minds. But this nobility that rises up in us and say, yeah, but I can't forgive myself. There are things behind it. And they have to be surgically addressed in you. Because the truth of God's word speaks against those ideas. You think you're right, you're not. Okay, so feelings versus facts. We have a way that we feel about all this, but there's facts in God's word that goes against those. Are we in agreement? Yeah. So let's, let's really, let's, let's drill down into a few of those. Feeling number one that we have, what I've done is too bad. If only God knew, right? <laughs> of course he knows. What I've done is too bad. The fact is, Jesus' suffering was enough for the worst sin and the sins you're still doing. Do you still have your white card? Jesus' death was enough. First Timothy 1, this is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners. And I'm the worst of them all, Paul says. A prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. I love that so much. <clears throat> Paul comes in the New Testament in the very first century and says, you think you're so bad? I'm worse. I want the trophy because that's how I feel. But what does Paul do with that? And, and he had reason, by the way. He killed Christians, if you know his history. He thought that they were leading God's people astray. And so he physically had them killed for real. And he went to whole families of Christians and had them thrown in prison. So you need to understand, in the first century, when the letter of 1 Timothy was circulating around the churches, some of those families may have still been in prison at the time. That's real. There may have been people in those first churches reading this letter and saying, heck yeah, Paul, you are the worst. He's owning it. But why is he owning it? He says, I'm a prime example of the great patience that God has with the worst of sinners. What he's saying is, no matter how bad it was, I'm forgiven. And I'm an example of forgiveness. I might have been the worst sinner. That means I'm the most forgiven. And that's how we have to take that stuff. That's what Jesus wants us to understand is his suffering was enough for all of us. This is a big New Testament idea. He wants you to stay forgiven. Next, I must punish myself more. I must do more. I must do more penance. No, you don't. The fact is self-punishment doesn't make you better. Only grace does. And this is a lie that's inside of us is we think the penance makes us better and it doesn't. We think the feeling bad. We think the extended guilt does something positive inside of our character. No, it doesn't. Never did. Oh, what does? Being forgiven of all of it. And if you really take that in and you really embrace that by faith, what starts to happen is you realize just how grateful you should have been all along. And gratitude and worship explodes out of your soul in a whole new way that you've never experienced before. What are you doing? You're trusting that God's plan actually works in a Christian life. Because when gratitude and worship starts to explode and God says, now here's the next thing I want to do, you say yes. Why? Because I have no rights anymore. If you knew what I'd been forgiven for, Jesus owns me now. Yeah, that's how it starts to work. And some of you are still stuck in the, the patterns of sin and the addictive sin that have happened even as you're a Christian. And you're like, if I just beat on myself more, I'll give up that addiction. No, you won't. And if you're the spouse of somebody in an addiction and you think your guilt trips toward them are somehow gonna bring them back around, they won't. Oh, I didn't say that first service. 
We can be okay? Guilting people doesn't do the thing we think it does. Guilting people drives them right down into the sand. People change with love and grace and forgiveness, and it's shocking and it's weird, and I know it's weird, but this is the gospel of Jesus. What does Paul say? I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God, not your penance, not your self-control, not your discipline. It's the power of God that you would believe it. Next, I'm still suffering, so that means I'm not forgiven. This is what we feel sometimes when we've had the big sin that's in the past and we're suffering because our ex-spouse still hates us and reminds us about it every single day. And we did the thing and we know we did the thing. And because we've got the punishment every single day in the earthly realm from people, we think that God must feel the same way. God also wants us to keep feeling punished. It's not true. Romans 9, Romans 5, sorry, verse 9 talks about natural consequences don't mean God is punishing you. God saves us from his wrath. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if we were enemies, uh, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, how much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? You're like, well, that's a mouthful. I know, but pay attention to the wrath part. Is he saying all the wrath is gone? What's wrath? Wrath is what you do to somebody because they deserve it and for no redemptive purpose at all. Right? Like sometimes, come with me here. Sometimes we put people in jail because we want them to be reformed. Whether or not you agree with that, sometimes that's the motive. Yes? But sometimes we're like, you just did a terrible thing and this is just justice. And so it just needs to be done. That's wrath. And he says, the wrath is over. You don't get wrath. You get grace. Wrath will happen at the end of time to people who reject Jesus totally. But you don't get wrath as a child of God. Maybe you were in a DUI and maybe maybe there was a crash and maybe people got hurt. and Maybe there's financial consequences and maybe there's consequences in the criminal justice system. And maybe you've got physical consequences in your own body and you live it every single day. And you're like, this is God's punishment. No, it's not. It's not what the Bible says. Your punishment for what you did was poured out on Jesus. Yes, there's natural consequences in this life and we want heaven. Can I get an amen? Amen. Because we will be free of all the natural consequences finally. But that is not God sending them at you. Next feeling. Last feeling. I can't forgive myself even if God can. The fact is, his forgiveness is all that matters. Your forgiveness does not matter. And it shouldn't matter. You're like, you're going to have to prove that one, Pastor. I know. Psalm 51, 4, against you and you alone have I sinned. This is David talking. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say and your judgment against me is just. Okay. King David, some of you know the story. He killed Uriah. He stole his wife. Did he owe Uriah an apology? You're like, well, he couldn't have. I know, but he owed it to him, right? Right? And he owed Bathsheba an apology. And a whole lot of people. And you're like, and the death of his son, and all this kind of, and the impact to his family, and the impact to the nation, and all these different things. It's like, was this a multi-layered fail? Of course it was. Are there a lot of people that he needed to go and somehow reconcile with and make amends? All that's true. And had he sinned against himself? Yes, he had sinned against himself. But he does this weird, I'm going to call it debt consolidation thing in this verse. He comes and says, you know what? If God is the king of all the universe and he's the only one actually innocent of anything, if he's truly my father in heaven and the creator of me, then his rights trump everybody else's rights. And he's ultimately the one person I'm ultimately responsible to. And he says he forgives me. And that means me forgiving me 
is a pretty small thing in the scheme of things. Again, do I need to go and repair relationships? Of course I do. Do I need to humble myself? Of course I do. But the way God sees this is you have got to, by faith, let him consolidate those debts at the king of the universe's throne. You got to come to him and let him forgive you because he's going to do a thing in your soul that's actually going to empower you to reconcile the rest of the stuff right. You got to get grace first and you got to have it settled first. And I, I, I know what the psychologists are trying to do in their books and stuff when they say you've got to forgive yourself, but it's just not true. What you have to do actually is you have to believe by faith that God has forgiven you. You have to start to bring your heart into alignment every single day and say, no, these feelings and those voices, the voice of the enemy and the voice of my pride, those are all lies and I'm not gonna believe them anymore. And starting today, I'm gonna believe this new thing that it's done as far as the east is from the west. He has removed my sins from me. It's done. Will you believe it? We gotta believe the gospel. Okay, wrapping up. I totally get this. This is me. Like I've got a whole section of my Christian life, season of my Christian life, where what was on that piece of paper for me, it haunted me every single day. And I had big things in my past and I had, I had addiction level stuff that was going on in my life, even as a Christian. Um, I was failing all the time. I had an out-of-control ego. I had an addiction to pornography. I had this judgmentalism that I brought to other people around me constantly. Super, super critical spirit. And they were deep things inside of me, and I knew that they were wrong, and I couldn't get a handle on them because I'd lived in them too long. Right? They were like old, comfortable clothes, right? And I just kept sliding into them over and over again. And I had to come to a place where I'm not going to live in a place of guilt constantly for these things. That's not the will of God with me. And oh, it rises up in you as soon as I say that, doesn't it? It's like, wait a second, you won't get better. (sighs) We're hardwired. (laughs) I had to believe that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was enough. And I had to believe that the more I embraced that in my forgiveness, the more that was going to be God's power in my life to start changing me. And it did start changing me. And I did cross a line and things started to change. And I'm telling you that that's my testimony, okay? This this is how it's supposed to work. And some of us are parents and we're in our homes And we talk a good Christian game and we talk about how forgiven we are and we talk about amazing grace and we don't live it and we don't experience it in front of our kids. And you know what the problem with kids is? Is they smell a fake a mile away. Where are you parents at? You know. And they grow up living in your house and and, and they grow up hearing, hearing words about forgiveness but knowing that what we really mean in the Christian life is that we don't actually do it. And guys, that... That will not reap the kind of fruit you want. It has to be real. Scared yet? It's got to be real. Last quote. This is Alan Redpath, and he's British also. He says, Savior with I-O-U-R. Isn't that amazing? British people sound smarter in everything that they say, (laughs) which is why we're ending with a British person. He said, it is not your sorrow that cleanses you from sin, but Jesus' blood. It is the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance. Has your sorrow for sin led you at one time or another to fling all the burden of it at the feet of a crucified, risen Savior? If it hasn't, anything short of that is what Paul here calls sorrow that leads to death. Would you stand? I love that he says, fling it.
Got your paper? He says, fling it. What does that mean? It means you're placing it right where it's supposed to be at the feet of Jesus. Done. It's like this line that you're going to cross that you've never crossed before. Yes? You've never crossed before. And I want you to cross that line today. And I want you to be done with it in a way that you've never been. And I don't want you to ever go back. So take your sheet. Crumble it up in your hand. The tighter you crumble it, the better of a Christian you are. (laughs) And why are we doing that? Because he said fling it. And when he said fling it, I'm like, that's what you do to trash. And yes, it is. Yes, it is. And so when we go to sing this last song, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask some of you if, you if you're okay with doing this. Walk up to the stage, and I just want you to drop it at the front of the stage, and that's just going to rep- represent for you. It's, it's going to be this exper- experiential moment. It's going to represent for you that you're giving it up. Once and for all, you're giving it up. And I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to say that you do that and you'll never have the feelings again and the thoughts will never come in again. They will. They will come in again. You're going to hear the voice of the accuser still. You're going to hear the voice of your pride still every single day. But every single day, you're going to refuse to listen to those and you're going to refuse to play the old tapes of your old sins. You're going to refuse it every single day because I dropped that. I, I set that down once and for all. And you're going to trust to believe the gospel every single day that it's done. And you're going to let the gospel start to change you. And the miracle that some of you guys are going to see, it's going to be awesome. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for dying for our sins completely and for real. Thank you, God, that you're suffering and the suffering that the Father poured out on you to pay for us that it, it was enough. We declare it was enough, God. And Lord, would you forgive us for, for going back to this stuff and trying to add to what you did, for maybe not believing. And I pray, Lord, that we would cross that line today. You would help us cross that line today do a miracle. We love you, Jesus. In Christ's name, amen.